Welcome to Jays for Jurisdiction. Today on the show, we are honored to have Reeve Paul McLaughlin. Reeve McLaughlin is currently serving his fifth term on Pinoca County Council and is the president of the Rural Municipalities of Alberta. He has been on the front line over the last few years as the role of municipal governments have been expanding and changing. We are looking forward to hearing from Reeve McLaughlin about his views on how the provincial and federal jurisdictions have changed the role and realm that is municipal governments. Reeve McLaughlin, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So, uh, Paul, I want to start with this overarching question. In your five terms on Pinoca County Council, have you seen the encroachment of provincial and federal jurisdictions into the downloading realm that is municipal government? And I always, I always tell this story. So before I was elected, uh, when I was elected, I was 37. And, and, and back in that day in 2007, I was probably one of the youngest people at the AAMDC conference back in the day. But the gentleman that I replaced his position, they actually locally referred to him as the road manager. And really the job of rural and municipal politician was roads. We talked about roads, we talked about bridges, roads, roads, roads. Fast forward to today, uh, Pinocchio County is talking about healthcare, talking about policing, talking about broadband, talking about economic development. And not that those aren't bad things to have in our wheelhouse, but you know, really within 20 years, uh, the role as a rural municipal leader has changed so significantly um, that that I would say that this job has transformed and we are dealing with all issues related to uh, to be a voice for all rural Albertans. Now, I want to ask one follow up to that before I let Ian uh, jump in here. And that is, is the role changing because of the downloading aspect or is the role changing because of the residential aspect? Because when I sit down and talk to uh, Reeves councillors and mayors, the uh, jurisdictions that all different levels of government have is kind of blurred when it comes to municipal government. So is the role changing? Is the jurisdiction changing? Or is it the downloading that changing and you are now dealing with more issues compared to what you were doing when you first were elected? Well, I think it's all of them. And I and I do think that what ha what's happened is, is municipal leaders have, have picked up the gauntlet um, and I won't be shy about it. I think that the that the uh, epistemic bubble, the bubble with which uh, MLAs and MPs live in, they've lost resonance for the voice for rural Albertans. So, um, so we've had to pick up the gauntlet and be that voice. Uh, back in the day, MLAs and, and ministers had the authority to speak on behalf and, and shoot from the hip. And now everything's sort of orchestrated, even at the MP level. Um, but we're not orchestrated at the municipal table, as you're well aware. Uh, and I think that there's some great things about that because we're the closest to the people. And I know that's always become cliche. Literally, we are. Literally, if I do something stupid, I will hear about it so quickly. It'll make your head spin uh, be, just because of that pure access that we have. So I do think it's been downloading. I think it's been that jurisdictional bleed over. But, you know, I, I do think it's important that We've managed to have to say, you know what, we need to be a voice, um, and, and I think a voice that's more close to, to the issues and closer to the ground, and that's been an important part of that shift that's occurred. I really like that term, jurisdictional bleed. I haven't heard that one before, but I can certainly understand what it what it means. We, I mean, even the way the Constitution is set up or our federalism is set up, that there are some uh, pieces of work, if you like, or areas of jurisdiction which seem to overlap. Things like energy, for example, where you and the feds and the province all have a parts of it or uh, it's showing up in things like abandoned oil wells, for example. Uh, you made a, an oblique reference to things like policing and how the real rural governments have moved away from roads, bridges and culverts. And so with that, what happens when there is a lack of jurisdictional clarity? How does RMA handle it or how does it, how do you as Panoka County handle that? Well, and I think it, it's been important to realize that when those gaps exist, the advocacy that has to occur. And if you look at our resolutions, um, very few of our resolutions now, less than 10 percent are related to infrastructure. And, and they're really tied to that that social framework, the FCSS is the, the, dealing with the policing, ambulance, health care. And, and I think what's happening is, is, truth be told, the leadership at the municipal level um, is trying to fill that gap where you've got that that piece where it's not being addressed, mm -hmm. resources aren't being allocated properly, and we are using anecdotal references on what's broken and using that as a, as a core voice. 
And, and I think that it's interesting because the Sovereignty Act's a great example. So our response to the Sovereignty Act is, okay, excellent. Uh, you know, do what you got to do. <laughs> but at the same time, we need to recognize some authorities, um, species at risk. So if I, Reba Pook County said, oh yeah, Sovereignty Act, um, Province of Alberta says I can take out the, the lesser wandering warbler habitat because you guys don't think it matters. Um, after I spend 10 years in jail and have a million dollar fine as the Reba Pook County, I'm seeing that as a bit of an issue. So respecting those jurisdictions and that, those authorities, I think is an important part of our role. Um, and then trying to backfill those holes that exist where, where things aren't being addressed, things aren't being done properly and, and we need to continue that voice. So is it that jurisdiction, jurisdictional creep or specifically where you're being either asked to do things you hadn't historically been asked to do, or as you have said, you're picking up the ball when others won't? Is it that, or is it the fact that you're getting these things, the responsibility, if you like, without some commensurate authority or commensurate resources to do that as well? Well, it, definitely. I mean, you know, uh, municipalities only have access to 10 cents on the dollar for every, for tax. And so we're having to do the best we can. But that being said, our tax efficiency is incredible. Um, you look at municipal leaders in, in general, uh, we are the most tight-fisted, we get things done, uh, quite literally in some cases with binder twine and, and duct tape, but all within engineering specs, just to be clear. I'm not saying right. that we have unsafe infrastructure. But but yeah, and that's I think probably what we regret the most is that I'm paying for policing. I just got a million dollar bill for policing. Um, I'm having to, I don't know what my future bill for policing is going to be because right. of all the discussions, body cams, who's paying for that. Um, you can see what's happened with the, with the negotiation of the contract and you, and, and one of the converse, conversations is around that retroactive pay. Someone was negotiating a contract. Um, President Tanine Rudick's probably got one of the best analogies is that, that, uh, we've been invited for dinner. Someone's chose what we're going to eat. Um, and then we get stuck with the bill. And we get treated like that from the federal and provincial government on a regular basis, um, that they're using us as a third funding source and it's regrettable, but that is literally in many cases, uh, they're using municipal taxation as a backfill for deficiencies and, and inefficiencies in, in other, uh, other, other programs. So it, it's one of those things that, when's the other shoe gonna drop? I don't know. Right. I Are wanna- Go go ahead, Ian. Uh, so you've uh, you obviously I shouldn't say obviously, but I suspect that you and your role as president of RMA uh, encounter other uh, provinces and territories, uh, particularly the rural uh, the rural governments in those. Are you seeing anything different across the country, or is this pretty much a trend that you're seeing nationally? This is a 100% national trend. I I I, I do have the fortune by I, I some of the. <laughs> on the executive of FCM and quite um, active with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. And so I talked to my colleagues all across Canada and it is exactly the same conversation um, that we've had to pick up the ball. And that's probably the best reference. We've had to pick up the ball and be that voice for our communities um, to make sure that, that programs are relevant to address those holes in the system. Um, and consistently what the, the common phrase is, is that, that uh, there is a large disconnect between the other levels of government and the people. And who's filling that gap? I, I do think it's leadership's filling that hole. Uh, you know, I, I, I asked for a raise of hands in a meeting the other day. Who, who's, who's seen their MLA lately? We're in, a, we're in campaign season in Alberta. Like we are full out in campaign season in Alberta, um, even though the writ hasn't been dropped. And very few people raise their hands. So we are not getting access to MLAs and MPs like we did in the good old days. And, and they are getting disconnected with the people. And that's just a fundamental reality. It's a good segue because uh, Ian and I will be chatting with three of your fellow uh, Reeves from Northern Alberta about that issue uh, later on in April. But I want to go back to the uh, police issue and the RCMP issue and the uh, health care. And I want to start with health care on this question. Municipalities and rural municipalities in particular are seeing a large uh portion of their council meetings talking about health care, whether it be the doctor shortages, whether that be closures of hospitals, that is a complete and utter provincial jurisdiction. No matter how you call it, it's a provincial jurisdiction. But you are seeing more councils across Canada looking at ways that, that they can attract 
municipalities. So how or not attract municipalities, attract doctors and tra- attract physicians. So how do you see your role as RMA president, but also Pinoca County Council dealing with jurisdictions that are completely in the realm of provincial jurisdictions, but the day-to-day operations are a complete and utter municipal jurisdiction, whether that be dealing with the closure of a local healthcare facility or the shortages of your doctors. How is the balance there? And going back to what Ian was talking about, how do you fulfill something that is so completely in another government's level's jurisdiction? Well, and we're having to fill an accountability vacuum. I like to stay in my lane. You know, I wish I was just talking about roads and bridges. That is my lane. And the problem is that the lane that I'm in, there's no ambulances to be found. So literally, there's a situation where there's a failure in the system. Um, having, and, and and I think healthcare is a perfect example. The, the hold my beer, we got this approach to governance has been a complete failure. And, and looking at ambulance is a perfect example. So they've created CoreFlex. And then on top of that, we had a, a, non, a no boundaries. And then we privatized. And then deals were made back in the day that we should have had an ambulance should be parked in my community every single day when they, they, they took ambulances from us, more or less, and said, we're going to centralize. Um, and what we've really seen is this centralization and the, the mega empire that's been created, um, the accountability at, the, at our level um, isn't there. And so we've got a choice to make. Oh, I'm going to stay in my lane and just talk about roads and bridges, or I'm going to try to be a voice for my community. And I you think feel it's heard. Not- I apologize, but do you feel heard? Because this is not an ongoing issue that just sprung up last week. This has been going on for some time now, and uh, rural municipalities and even urban municipalities are facing the crunch of that. And whether it comes to federal or provincial jurisdictions, are you feeling heard from your provincial and federal counterparts, or is it completely cricket sometimes? I, I think sometimes it is. I think on this file, I think that it, it is so broken. I've had ministers pull me aside and said, we need your help because this is so broken. Um, literally because of the, the framework and the structure that the AHS is, for example, um, it, need, it, is, it is unfixable if you treat it as a third party mega entity. It is not, you cannot fix this because they will constantly tell you, no, we got this. What they will do is they'll change their indicators, they'll change their KPIs, they will constantly um, construct a, a different sort of reality than what exists in order to provide accountability. And so the hard part is, is that it was so broken and people kept saying, no, we've got this, it's good, that all it took was um, literally interfacing with a worldwide pandemic and the system's collapsing. And it's collapsing in front of us. In Newfoundland, Nurses are quitting. Um, doctor recruitment is down all over all over the world. Uh, veterinary medicine has literally there is no vets available. Literally, we have a crisis on veterinary medicine. So all these pieces come together, and I think that if you really really have that conversation, is this has been a slow moving train that has crashed, um, and and we've seen it happening. We've raised red flags, and then all of a sudden someone's aware of, aware of, you know, wait a minute, it is broken. You know, the one thing I, I will say is, is that I would sure, I would sure love to hear some honesty from other levels of government admitting when something's broken and admitting that they did something wrong. I would just want to hear that once to bring me joy because I'll admit every time I screw something up, but I sure see all lovers of government playing the game that they'll never admit that they're wrong and they'll never apologize for mistakes that were made by their government. And mm-hmm. that needs to change. That needs to become part of the, the culture of governance. Uh, truth be told, you know what? Don't don't tell me you got this when you don't. Tell me you're trying the best you can uh, and tell me that you're going to fix it if it if it's broken. That's That's how I've raised my kids and that's how my kids have raised me. Sorry, I want to jump in one last time here before I, I gave Ian the cue to get his uh, question next, but I want to talk, talk about bridges for a second. Be- uh, I want to go up to Lesser Slave River here for a second because Lesser Slave River was dealing with a bridge infrastructure issue. The province had downloaded that bridge onto a municipality and the municipality said, well, we can't fix it. We just can't. How much of advocacy and lobbying the government does your job now entitle compared to when you were first elected back in 2007? Because the role of rural municipalities has drastically changed 
even through the pandemic, but I would say probably about five years before the pandemic, where it became more of a lobbying aspect and less of a day to day operations of passing policies at your county at your council table. Oh, I mean, there's the the, the growth of the uh, the lobbying industry is quite significant that are working with municipalities. If that tells you something that, <laughs> that either they're not effectively working through their MLAs, which back in the day, you'd tell your MLA, this bridge is a mess. Can you advocate for me? And, and likely that isn't resonating. And I think that, you know, the bridge in, in Lesser Slave, I think, is is a fascinating conversation. I mean, you look at the history of that bridge and, and, and you know, that's World War II. That's the old uh, uh, that's the old Alaska Highway infrastructure. And people are driving on what would be an actually a historical heart artifact that happens to feed, uh, significantly feed the GDP of Alberta. You're going to hear from our from our northern members that the their contribution to GDP is significant, but the flow back is quite minimal. Um, the fact is that those good folks are really keeping our our economy afloat uh, and providing that cash flow, but they're not seeing uh, resources flow the other direction. And and Lesser Slave is a perfect example. That is a critical infrastructure. Um, that just isn't being addressed. And the local MLA, uh, I don't know, I think he, was, he might have been in Mexico when the when they started talking about complaining about the bridge, but uh, quite literally, I think he was in Mexico. But the... Uh, <laughs> Wasn't trying to throw Pat Wren under the bus here. Yeah. Right. Well, but, you know what? And here's, the, here's my other comment because we're coming into election. You, you got to think of what the best job in the world is as an MLA. You get to, you get to go to 50th wedding anniversaries you get to you have staff that answer your calls for you that can can tell you're working on it. You get to go to the big house and be in the fancy dome and solve things. It's it's literally if you do the job, you will be elected forever. Like you literally if you listen to your people and you advocate for them and you're a voice for them. And when you don't do that, guess what? You turtle and you hide. And that's what's happening. I'm seeing on the ground and you're not seeing action from we need to empower these MLAs. To have an open voice and to advocate for their members um because guess what's happening truth be told what's happening then is municipalities are having to be the voice that the mla used to be and they're having to hire lobbyists or starting to lobby for projects like this which to me it's a foregone conclusion that that critical infrastructure that bridge in lesser um that is a provincial responsibility because they're getting the royalties on the back end of it and why does lesser slave have to advocate for themselves it's because um, those elected officials at the that the federal or the provincial level just aren't doing their job. That's an interesting comment on the role of the MLA. Or is, is their job to advocate for the government to you or to you to the government? And it seems to have flipped based on what you said. The other question, another question I have is about the, the role of the federal government versus the role of the provincial government here. And are you seeing any more responsiveness from, uh, say, a federal government than a provincial government or vice versa when it comes to these issues or the lack of jurisdictional parity on some things? You know, I, I've had an interesting, uh, I had the privilege of, of talking to MP Carr actually before he he passed. And and I had a, just a great discussion. He was a real big advocate for the prairies. He just had a love for the prairies and, and he was such a great voice. And one of the comments that he made is that, that uh, the federal government is too busy looking at seats and not looking at people. And, and that they're, they've spent way more energy trying to deal with the, the politics of, of liberal versus conservative and NDP and, mm -hmm. and not addressing the, the, those big picture issues that, that are thinking are important. And in fact, um, some of the steps they've taken, but, but I do think, you know, it's bubble within a bubble within a bubble. And I, and I do think that, that, you know, we still have that ongoing problem that we are very far from Ottawa. And the further you are from Ottawa, the 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 less likely that you're connected to your to your federal government. And I think that's a that's a reality. Um, that that's a reality at the local level. Um, the folks on the west end of Pinocchio County, the far west end, they don't feel like they're as connected as the people that are right beside the town of Pinocchio. And and that's you know that's geography, right? You mentioned you you some of the things you've talked about are are kind of how we got to where we are right now. So we know what the past is, and we kind of have an idea what the present is. Do you see any trends happening? What do you think is going to happen over the next 5, 10, 20 years in terms of this uh, this jurisdictional clarity? Is it going to get any more clear, less clear? And, you know, I, and I think some positive pieces. I think that, you know, I, I'm obviously uh, biased. Uh, I'm not even cognitive bias. I'm full of bias that I believe in local government. Um, you know, historically, uh, education to a certain extent was under, under local government and health was too. And, and, 
this sort of bigger is better centralization conversation is really a disconnect between a better way to deliver services. And I actually believe in local decision making and 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 I do believe in local use of resources. Um, my relationship with my local RCMP detachment is strong. We're getting the work done. We're providing the resources. Um, every time you level up, it becomes less dis less connected. And I think that we can probably, you know, going back to the past of, of empowering local government, I think is a solution. What comes with that, though, is the resource conversation. Right. You know, how do your resource um, in order for you to effectively deliver those services? But I would say if you've got if you've got some and I think that really if you've got some of those local leaders together to solve problems, I think you'll have some really, really deep thinkers now. Uh, really strong people that really just want to make their communities better. And I think that's a, that's something we should leverage. Um, that's something that I think we should take advantage of. Um, and I think that the fact that they're so connected and so responsive to their communities, you almost can't lose if you're, you're involving that local voice. Um, you'll probably make way better solutions than you will if you're stuck in downtown Ottawa or in the big house in, in uh, Edmonton. I want to... I want to talk, I want to get the political question out of the way here because over the next few weeks we're going to be hearing a lot in up the province of Alberta about Calgary. And I'm pretty sure you're uh, not surprised when I am going to ask this question, but there's a lot of focus on urban centers. And when they change jurisdictions, uh, whether it be funding for AHS, whether that be RCMP, whether that be small individual issues, they are looking at the urban centers, but you as the rural reeve have to face the consequences of the changes of the jurisdictions when it comes to urban centers. Now, I'm not trying to make this a urban versus rural issue, but I'm going to because I think it's an important question I'm going to ask. How do you as a rural councillor, county, reeve, deal with issues when provincial and federal governments don't even look at you when they're making changes like healthcare when it's going to affect larger cities, but it's also going to affect your community and your population as well. Yeah, I think I, I, I'd be foolish if I didn't recognize that in Alberta, 85% of the population live in what would be deemed urban and 15% are rural. Um, that being said, um, those 15% of the people um, actually contribute to 28 to 30% of the GDP. So each one of us actually contribute twice of, of what an urban does to G GDP. 44% of capital investments in rural Alberta. Um, that being said, everything we talk about that is that is Alberta is typically rural. It's actually talking about our resource industry, our water, our agriculture. So, um, so you know, we are stewards of the land, um, and and this becomes that conversation. I think that that typically do is it vote chasing. So really, it's a foregone conclusion. That ninety percent of the of the communities I represent are gonna are gonna vote a certain way. That that polls are saying that history is saying that. Um, I think many of us are haunted by our parents and have to vote according to what our parents told us to vote. Um, and okay, so, Paul, I'm gonna interrupt because I've got to ask this question because just for my own transparency here, yeah. I have yelled and screamed into the void that is social media about polls and about these pr predictive seat uh, guessing games. Is that true? Is it is it you or is it a foregone conclusion that no matter what, even if a poll was not published tomorrow, your community, your area would vote a certain way no matter what because of that family tradition? Because and this may not even make it into the show. I just want to know for my own <laughs> transparency because I have gotten backlash after backlash by saying polls are the worst thing that have happened to democracy in a long time. <laughs> polls are so I I talk to friends that they literally, their hobby is if a pollster calls them, they lie. They lie the whole time. They lie from the beginning of it. They've made their name up. They've lied on their demographics. All of them make zero dollars and they always vote exactly the opposite of what they do vote. Um, and I think that, and, and the other problem with polling is, is that that uh, I think my parents still have a landline. <laughs> I'm not sure who has a landline anymore. Like, I don't know how they're tracking you down. Plus online polling, like seriously, these days, you can't even get <laughs> So, and, and if you if you tell me it's an online poll, then that just tells me either either it's true or it's been polluted by people just you know raving it and changing it. I think there is a shift, and you know I have to say from a political standpoint, I've seen just as much frustration from my members of this UCP government as they did with the NDP government. 
And that tells me a lot. That tells me one key thing is, is that if both governments we've had over the last eight years is frustrating to my members, um, that's very telling to me. Um, and that may not manifest itself in voting, but it tells me that there is something seriously amiss with, with that level of government. Um, so, so there's a disconnect. And I think that that, that shift needs to occur. Uh, and I think that, so, so I would agree, polling is of no consequence. Um, I, you know, if we started to vote for people we thought could do a really good job at the local level, uh, like MLAs that were heavy hitters and we knew would go up and advocate and who cares what banner they are, we should hide it. We should hide what party they're in and just say, you know, here's who you are and, and tell your story. Um, if we were voting based on aptitude and not party affiliation, geez, we would have an amazing government because I'll, I'll be honest. And again, my bias, uh, municipal people don't carry any banners. They're voted for who they are and, and how they're going to best represent locally. And I think that's why you get the quality people at the municipal level that are very strong voices. Um, it's not about their party affiliation. It's, it's about who they are and, and can they fight for you? And the other, the other comment on that, I think is quite important is that, that, um, I'm on my fifth term. I was never elected because of my resume uh, or what my job history was. I was elected because people believe that I will I will be a voice for them um, at the federal level, at the provincial level. And, and I'll ensure at the council table that I'll represent my district as best possible. And, and that's what it's all about. It's not about what I know, it's whether I can be a voice for them. And that's how you can be a successful politician. Somebody once told me that um, no matter who you vote for, the government always wins. That's true. <laughs> That's a very great term for sure. I, uh, my final question for you, Paul, is um, about you've mentioned that 15% of people, give or take, are rural and the rest are urban. The issues, however, of jurisdictional creep, as you suggested, seem to cross over that rural and urban and be of interest to both. Do you, do you advocate... Um, for these uh, jurisdictional issues with the urban municipalities as well, or do you find yourself at odds with the uh, the urban association? No, I, I think we we work quite well, and I think uh, rural rural remote, which can include rural urban remote. Okay, it's the same. It's the same discussion, and literally, you just take a bubble out an hour outside the metros. Um, you know, it's funny. I was in. A, I was actually at the AB Muni's conference, and I was hearing. Hearing, uh, um, you know, former former Mayor Iveson speaking about the metro and and about the kingdom that is Edmonton, and and those discussions, it's interesting because I'm reading the room and everybody that's in that's in the club that's post Edmonton are like, woohoo, this is so awesome, we're gonna be so big, we're gonna take over the world, and you could just tell, I could read the room and I'm looking at people that are further away from Edmonton, they're just crossing their arms, going, oh, here we go, they're just gonna be big, and oh, we're gonna like they're just big, 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 big is better, you guys. These are so awesome. And the further we get away, our services change, our account the accountability change, the voice that we have to lose. And it doesn't matter whether you're rural or urban, it's really geography. And so I think we have a lot in common with a lot of the members from, from AB Munis. And I and I think that uh, we do pick up on those things. And, and our relationship is, you know, once in a while we'll disagree, but for the most part, we're uh, we're always fighting for the same things, for different reasons and different views. Sure. And one thing about urban versus rural, because I know you don't want to talk about the difference, but I, I get asked this all the time and it's a lens. So, so we, we are, we, my organization represents 85% of the land base in the province of Alberta. And we see, we see ourselves as stewards of the land. So we look at infrastructure, roads, you know, farmland, though that conversation and our urban counterparts see it as people. And, and so those two lens um, see the same world with a completely different lens. And that's not a bad thing. Um, you know, we see it from with a landscape lens and, and our urban counterparts see it with, with, a, with a residence lens, but uh, with a population lens. But, but we do have similarities, but when those two collide, it's just a different view of the world. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. And my running joke is, is that um, we're, my members are upset about strychnine regulations and changes in access to strychnine. And I'm pretty sure that hasn't occurred around most town council tables. And so that's a bit of a difference or ergot or, or seed cleaning plants. Um, but that being said, but we're still worried about our FCSSs and our social health care. And we all want to be able to make sure an ambulance gets to our house. So we do have similarities from those perspectives as well. 
My last question for you, Paul, is um, there is a report that was published earlier this year from a uh, University of Guelph where it examined rural Ontario municipalities, and the title of it was Doing More With Less. Uh, we've talked about jurisdiction a lot over the last uh, half hour, but I want to know from you, are municipalities asking to do more with less? And if so, how do you, as I'm going to say rural ca- councils, deal with issues when it comes to RCMP, health care, whether it comes to unpaid oil and gas property taxes, and the downloading of provincial and federal jurisdictions onto municipalities. How are you surviving by doing more with less money? <laughs> that's that's the that's the million dollar question. Um, which literally it's a multi million dollar question. It I, you know so look at look at the trajectory. So I'll, I'll I could speak of Pinocchio County's finances because I know them extremely well. So seventy percent of our tax revenues from oil and gas. Um, we have older legacy fields that are depleting. Uh, my municipality has written off $5.5 million of unpaid oil and gas taxes. We still have probably another less than a million that's at risk. Um, but I also have a changing landscape. I have the situation where I've got these legacy fields. I've got this depleting resource so that the demand for that resource is changing, not that it won't still be there. Um, so I've got that situation. Then I have the downloading conversation. And I can see by my trajectory that that... I am going to have an issue um, five to seven years from now. And I'm going to have an issue with decre- lowering tax rates. Um, I'm going to have a situation with infrastructure demands. I'm going to have a situation where we're downloading. Um, and I'm going to have a financial problem. Uh, right now, the, the provincial government has entrenched in the last budget a billion dollars less than what we should be entitled to uh, under MSI, which became LGFF, a billion dollars. So they've shortchanged municipalities a billion dollars uh and and so that is going to catch up with us and we are going to have an infrastructure deficit in this province five to seven years from now from a decision that's made today so what we're going to continue to do is say where's our money we we should be entitled to a billion dollars plain and simple uh and the fact is is that part of our tax room uh on property tax is absorbed by education so three billion dollars comes out of your taxes as all albertans property owners uh goes to the provincial government as school tax that's tax room that's not available to us and that was the whole the whole idea behind msi so in my county i'm mid-level so i'm a mid-sized county anybody on either end of me is going to have the same story in some cases worse um, anybody that actually is a smaller municipality with a smaller population and more remote is going to be actually on a faster churn for, for financial issues. And I'm seeing that already. Um, and so it's going to be diversification, economic development. It's going to be looking for ways to replace the oil and gas industry as our future tax source, as well as having increasing demands from population increases in rural Alberta and a more demanding uh, need for the folks that are moving to rural Alberta. Uh, the folks that are moving here, they're the engineers, the, the nurses, the folks that came from the city of Calgary uh, or city of Edmonton, uh, they demand a lot more services than what Pinocchio County provides. And we have to dance that dance, which is quite a complex dance, uh, because there's an independent group of folks out here that take care of their own thing. Um, and we've had people move to our county going, so what days do you clear my driveway of snow? And the answer is never. Um we, you clear your own driveway and people are shocked. They're like, what? You guys don't clear our driveways? No, everything past your end of your road is yours. So no, we we don't clear driveways. Um, Reeve, I want to thank you so much for sitting down and doing this. This has been an honor to sit down and chat with you about the jurisdictional changes that we've seen over the last few years and how it's impacting communities like Pinocchio County, but also rural councils. So thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks for having me.